happy Sunday and welcome to Church at Home. We are so grateful that you've carved out some time to spend with us this morning. I just wanna invite you, if you're in the DMV area, please join us in person. We have services at the AMC Hoffman right at 8.30 and 10 o'clock. Um, we'd love to see you there. And also Easter Sunday is just a few weeks away, April 17th. Mark your calendars and prepare to join us in person. Now let's get ready for worship. Open up my heart to you now. 
My desire is to know you deeper. Love, I will open up again. Throw my fears into the wind. I am desperate for a touch of heaven. Oh.
Hey church, right now we're going to continue uh, in worship with the bringing of our tithes and the giving of our offering. And uh, the tithes, that first 10% and our offering, as anything above and beyond uh, that. And I believe when we take that step and put God first in this area, we're simply growing in our obedience uh, to Him. So I just want to encourage you, uh, maybe you've been consistent uh, in this area, or maybe this is something new uh, to you and you, sh you just need to take that step. I want to encourage you to do just that. Take the step, trust Him in this area, uh, and watch Him show up in an amazing way. Uh, so right now we're going to go into the message. Why don't you go ahead and grab a pen of uh, maybe your iPad, take some notes, uh, enjoy today's message. Hey church, I'm so glad that you're carving out some time to gather together uh, around God's word. Uh, we're in a collection of sermons called Crown and Cross, where we're looking at the identity and the purpose of Jesus through the lens of Mark's gospel. So I want to invite you to come with me to Mark chapter 10. And we're going to pick up and begin reading at verse 32. Uh, let's read the scripture together. It says, And they, the disciples, were on the road going up to Jerusalem. And Jesus was walking ahead of them. And they were amazed. And those who followed were afraid. And talking, the tw taking the twelve again, he began to tell them what was going to happen to him. And he said, See, we're going to go up to Jerusalem. And the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priest." And the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles. And they will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him. And after three days, he will rise. Continuing now, he says, And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came up to Jesus and they said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us one to sit at your right hand, and then one to sit at your left in your glory. And Jesus said, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink, or to be baptized with the baptism which I am baptized? And they said to him, we are able. And then Jesus responded, the cup that I drink, you will drink, and with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. And then when the ten heard it, they began to be indignant at James and John. And Jesus called them and he said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you, but whoever should be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. Verse 45 is where we'll stop today. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Let's bow our heads and our hearts for prayer. Father, we love you. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. God, I thank you for your word. Lord, let us never take for granted, Lord, the opportunity to gather around your word together. Let us never take for granted the opportunity to dive into your word. Lord, even uh, as we are alone, as we're in, in moments of peril, as we're in moments of, of concern and celebration, God, your word stands true and it remains. And so, God, let us be people of the word. Let us be people of the spirit. And God, let us be people that would say one to another, the word and the spirit are more than enough. And so God, be with us in the next few minutes. We're grateful for that now and forever. And all God's people said, amen. I want us to keep in mind as we look at this passage, what we just talked about last week. We talked about the interaction between Jesus and the rich young ruler. 
I want us to see in contrast of these two passages what takes place. Jesus, when interacting with this rich young ruler, who by his own claim has kept the commandments since his youth, but he only had kept a portion of them. There's only some of them that he that he kept. And Jesus, as he probes him, if you'll remember, as he begins to talk with him, Jesus kind of points and pushes on the reality that you might be doing well to keep some of the commandments, but there are some of the commandments that you're actually telling on yourself that you're not keeping, that you're not following him. So remember the moment where Jesus says to him, take all of the things that you have, take your possessions, take your wealth, give it away, and then come follow me. The rich young ruler leaves grieved, distressed, and he walks away. I want us to read and think of this passage now in light of that interaction. The rich young ruler, unwilling, unable, within himself to give this great cost, to give of himself, And now in light of that, we see Jesus telling of his death the third time the disciples. I want us to remember that in Mark chapter 8 and in Mark chapter 9, Jesus has predicted his death. He has kind of keyed into the disciples. He's kind of thrown out this reality on what sort of his purpose is. So not only is his identity being unfolded and solidified in their minds and their hearts, Jesus is also wanting to make sure that they are fully aware of his purpose, that they're fully aware of why he has come. So in chapter 8, he begins to sort of unfold this idea that the Son of Man must suffer many things, that he'll be rejected by the chief priests and the teachers of the law. And then in verse Uh, In verse 30 of chapter 9, Jesus also begins to kind of add some other layers into this, that there's going to be a betrayal, that he will be betrayed, and then he will be kind of given over to the ruling authorities, and then that they are going to kill him. Jesus is laying sort of some breadcrumbs for them. But now here, this third time, this third prediction of Jesus' death There's more information, there's more detail, there's more sort of explicit unfolding of what is to come and what they can expect. And so these these words of Jesus, following Jesus, I want you to see in the very beginning of, of this passage, there are two emotions that I want us to key on because I think every disciple that follows Jesus, every person that's following Jesus are going to have sort of these two emotions and feelings present. And I want us to not only be aware of them and acknowledge them, but I want us to understand that they have their proper place. And those swirling emotions, we see it here very in in the beginning of, of verse 32. It says that they were amazed and that they were afraid. Listen to me. Following Jesus, whether you've been doing that for a little bit of time or you've been doing that maybe for the majority of your life, those that follow Jesus are going to find themselves in postures of amazement and wonder. There will be times and seasons and moments of your following Jesus where you will be in awe, where you will simply read the scripture, you will see the activity of the Holy Spirit, and you will know that God is moving significantly and you follow him with a sense of amazement. But friend, I don't want you for a moment to lose sight that there also may be times and there will be times that you're going to follow Jesus and that amazement will fade into a sense of you being afraid, you being worried or concerned. And now now hear me on this. The being afraid isn't questioning who Jesus is. The being afraid is actually having your humanity on display and wondering perhaps if you can actually follow through with the following of Jesus. You see, Jesus' words have been weighty to these disciples. They're just coming out of a conversation where Peter says, who can be saved then? If this rich young ruler can't be saved, how can we be saved, and Jesus begins to unpack the difficulty of following him. So perhaps 
the awe and wonder moving into a, a period of, of oh no and afraid is simply them counting the cost and wondering, can I actually do this? Can I actually follow Jesus to the place and to the point of where he's going? I think those two emotions are present in those that follow Jesus just like they were here in the passage. Jesus is explicit that he has not come to serve, but that his life was being offered in service to others. And then he uses this powerful phrase. He says that his purpose was to die and be a sacrifice, that he was to be a ransom for many. Now that's language that we don't hear and use much. To me, if I'm honest, whenever I hear the word ransom, I think of kidnapping. I think of a letter where someone cut out words and letters and they pasted it on some sort of deal and they're requesting a ransom. You have to pay and then we'll release this person. That's kind of the only framework we have for that. But in the scriptures, when it talks about it, the, the, the Greek word there simply means this, to buy or purchase the freedom of a prisoner or a slave. This is what it means when the scriptures are talking about ransom, to purchase back a prisoner. So friends, make no mistake, as Jesus is talking about and making his purpose clear to his disciples, what he's saying to them is that his purpose was to die and be a sacrifice. I want us to kind of key in on two things, and I want you to write these down. The first one is this, in regarding Jesus' sacrifice is one, that he was a willing sacrifice. That Jesus was a willing sacrifice. I love how Tim Keller says this. He says, Jesus didn't have to die to, dis to despite God's love. He had to die because of God's love. And it had to be this way. Listen to this phrase that Keller uses. He says that all life-changing love is a substitutionary sacrifice. He said that all of, of love in life that is life-changing or life-altering requires a substitutionary sacrifice. I want you to think about that just in light of the relationships that you have been in in life. You've heard this said before, right? Relationships require sacrifice. Require sacrifice. The, the, the reality is this, is there might be four or five people in our city that don't really need anything in relationships. They're, you know, functional. Like, they got everything going well for them. There's like zero sort of drag in regards to their, their needs, wants. Like, they're just, they got it all together and their life is sort of like Perfect. There might be four people like that. Maybe you know them. You're probably not one of them. Neither am I. I, I. I laugh at this. Why? Because all of us in relationships, we're needy. All of us, when we come into relationships, we're wounded. All of us on some level in relationships, we carry baggage from previous seasons, previous relationships, other interactions, and the reality is this, is if, you, if you've ever tried to love someone that has needs or they're walking around with these conditions, if you've ever tried to love somebody who is in trouble, here's what you know. Their woundedness, their trouble, what they're bringing into the relationship, you can't love that person or individual without taking a hit yourself. You can't be in that relationship without it requiring something of you. Listen to me. I'm not talking about being codependent. I'm just talking about the reality of being in relationship with people. If they're going through something and I'm in relationship with you, then I'm in that situation. And the waves that they're going through are going to end up hitting my boat as well, you can't love that person without taking a hit. A transfer of some kind is required so that their troubles and their problems, that they can kind of get to a place of resolve. It's going to require something 
of you the only way that we can start filling up emotionally and helping others heal emotionally is if someone loves them. And the way to love them is allowing at some level ourself to be emotionally drained. We've all seen people in relationships, though, where there were these sort of barriers and walls, and there was one person who was unwilling to give of themselves, give of their emotion, give of their feeling, give of their time. You can fill in the blank. And that relationship always will seem lacking if there is not reciprocity, if one is not giving and receiving and the other is then giving and receiving. And so I just want us to be aware that relationships, even at a level that we all kind of understand and interact with, they do require someone, each of us, giving of ourselves so that the other might get to a place of healing or get to a place of health or get to a place where the relationship itself is now fortified and strong and you're lifting the other person up. Another great way to kind of understand and think about this idea of of a willing sacrifice in relationship, because don't forget what Keller says. He says that all of life-changing love is substitutionary sacrifice. Think about this through the lens of a parent. When you have children, they are in a state of dependency. Every parent knows this. From the moment the child is born, and probably even before that, you have an unwavering devotion and, excuse me, and love for that individual. They haven't done a thing. The reality is they can't do anything. They cry a lot, they eat, they change their diapers. They have so many needs, they can't stand on their own and they're not going to just grow out of their dependency automatically. Think about this, the only way that your children will grow beyond their dependency into self-sufficient adults is for the parents to essentially abandon their own independence for say 18 to 20 years or so. Think about the sacrifice that that is. I can remember times as we're kind of raising our kids and they're getting older and that comes with its own pains, uh, as parents can, can well tell the story. It's a sad thing sometimes to see your children move into different phases and different stages. But I remember, I remember significant moments with each of our kids where we were out in a, a restaurant and they were younger. And we made the mistake, as parents often do, to bring small kids to a restaurant. Because in your mind, you think your kid's never going to be the kid that acts crazy in a restaurant when they're like between one and two years old. But the reality is every kid does that. Every kid's making noise. Every kid's misbehaving. Every kid's just being a normal kid, right? Their their hands are in your food, in their hair, like all of these sorts of things. And I remember we would be at dinner and we would be with friends, maybe colleagues from work. And Nicole and I would have just this frustration or there's the the sense of like, oh, and I can remember moments where we would cut dinner short. We'd head home. Why? Because we knew they're just being who they are. They're just being kids. They're not in trouble. They haven't done anything wrong. They've just done what one-year-olds do. And so we would make these sacrifices socially, if you will. Maybe not to go and do this or not to be in this place or not to be in in these environments because what we were doing is we knew if we focus our intention on the kids for a period of time as they grow and adjust, they're going to learn. I want to simply say this, that you you can't make, you can make the sacrifice, right? But if you don't make it, who's going to? Who's going to make the sacrifice so that your kids, if the parents don't do it, who else is going to do it? It's either, friend, you making a sacrifice as a parent or ultimately your kids will be sacrificed. Come on, we've all been around people, whether they were in adulthood or you were in their their teenage years, their adolescence. And we were all very aware that certain sacrifices weren't made for them when they were younger because maybe the parents or their environments were unwilling or unable to surrender their own independence so that this child might be 
raise and grow into their own. So now when they're in a place and in a season where they're supposed to be stepping into their independence, they're unable to because they were not given the tools necessary. Someone didn't sacrifice for them so that they could be full and whole in that time. The reality is it makes perfect sense that a God who is more loving than you and I, that that God would come to the world and the way in which he would deal with evil, the way in which the payment and price would be paid is through this love that substitutes this love that is a sacrifice. You see, we know even flawed humans know that evil can't be overlooked, but it has to be dealt with and the debt had to be paid. And unfortunately, sometimes people, when they look at this, they they ask the wrong question. Who is the debt paid to? Who's the debt paid to is a question, but it's not even the best question to ask. When we recognize the debt that need to be paid, this is where the Bible is so radically different from the other primitive gods. You see, the ancients understood that the wrath of God, they understood the idea of justice, they understood the debt, necessary punishment, but they had no idea or expectation that God would come and pay it himself. This is where Christianity stands alone in the face of other religions. Jesus gives his life willingly, a willing sacrifice. The cross, friends, is the self-substitution of God for man so that the penalty, the payment, the price is paid. God lays his life down. There's sacrifice. And we, friends, are the benefactor of that love. The second thing I want us to see about Jesus' sacrifice, not only is it willing, but it's humble. So this is where you see this sort of change in the narrative where now James and John, they're walking along and they take the opportunity to kind of come up to Jesus and they're like, and they, and they say something that is, I think it's, if I'm honest, I think it's worthy of rebuke. Like we've seen in other places where Peter says some stuff, Jesus rebukes him. Like James and John here, they're a little bit out of pocket and they're asking a question and it's laced with some motives. Jesus is aware of that. And I'm like, Jesus rebuked those fools. And the reality is Jesus says back to them, one of the most powerful things and questions that I think you and I have to be prepared to answer. Jesus says, what do you want me to do for you? You see, their question is, Jesus, we want you to do whatever we ask of you. My kids all the time are asking for, if you've seen this movie, Dad, can we have, Mom, Dad, can we have a yes day? Can we have a day where you and and Mom just say yes? And I'm like, absolutely not. Like, no, we're not doing that. We can have a no day. That's what we can do. Jesus basically says to them as response to this question, hey, we want you to do anything we ask. And Jesus goes, okay, what do you want me to do for you? You see, the way in which James and John answer that question exposed their heart. The way in which you and I answer that question as well, it exposes our heart. James and John say to them, say to Jesus, he says, let us sit at, at, one, at one side and let, let the other one sit to the other side of you when you come into your glory. You see, again, all of the talk of the kingdom, all of the talk of of Jesus sort of setting things right, they're still thinking of this, not through the lens of Jesus's words, but through their ideology of what they've experienced in other places. And so now Jesus says to them another question that's powerful. He says, can you drink this cup? Can you drink this cup? Can you experience the baptism that I'm going to experience? He said, you're asking to see, to, to be seated next to me, but can you, can you go the path that I'm, I'm going? And they said, of course we can. And Jesus' response to them, he says, fine. He says, you said you can do it? Sure. Then you're going to drink the cup and you're going to experience the baptism. He says, but the reality is I can't give up these seats because they're not mine to give away. I want us to for a moment to fast forward and remember as Jesus is dying on a cross, who is to the left 
and to the right of him. One of the beautiful things about the gospel is the disciples and those that follow Jesus desire to be seated in in exalted places. And yet when Jesus, in the moment of his inauguration as king of kings and his kingdom is beginning, he is enthroned upon a cross and to the left and to the right of him is a thief, a robber, the people who were despised. Jesus is demonstrating that those who were less are being made more. Those who were forgotten are now in places to be known and remembered. Friend, you and I as followers of Jesus, let us always remember that the places of exaltation near Jesus are for those who don't deserve it. Not those that are seeking it, not those that are looking for position or looking for power. And the reality is Jesus sort of unfolds this even deeper to the other disciples because I love this in the Bible. It says the other 10 heard what they were asking and they were indignant. Why were they upset? Because they didn't ask the question. James and John were asking what was in their hearts probably. They beat them to the punch. They're like, man, James and John are going to get the good seats. And Jesus pulls them together and he says, hey, here's the problem. You're thinking about this kingdom thing through the lens of the empire. He says, you're thinking about this kingdom thing all the wrong way. You see, when Jesus talks to them about the cup, the cup is referring to, in the Hebrew scriptures, is a metaphor always of the judgment of God. Jesus is asking, can you drink the cup? In other words, can you deal with and be in the place where you are going to have to satisfy the wrath of God? Talks about the baptism of the immersion, that this is not something that is just going to be partial. This is going to be complete and in totality for Jesus. And he says, is this what you want? Because don't make a mistake. The leadership that you've been seeing is not the leadership that is experienced and expressed in the kingdom of God. This downward mobility that we see in the kingdom of God, Henry Nouwen uses that phrase always to talk about the kingdom of God, that it is not this up and to the right, but that it is a downward mobility. It is a seeking, not of exaltation, but it is finding ways to lift up others. You see, if we are trying to frame our leadership and our purpose and our design by the light of the empire, we will lose the purpose and the plan that God has for us. You and I can't find purpose in the empire. You and I are supposed to find purpose at the foot of the cross. The scriptures say in Jeremiah 29, there's a verse in there that we always love to quote, but one of my favorite parts about that entire chapter is where Jeremiah says this. He says, I want you to seek the wholeness and the welfare of the city you find yourself in. Again, he's talking about Babylonian captivity. He says, I want you to serve and love the people that don't speak your language, the people that might even be oppressing you, the places that are uncomfortable in your life. They don't look like you. They don't act like you. They don't believe like you. They don't talk like you. I want you to seek their prosperity, their welfare. Because in doing that for them, you're going to find a blessing for yourself. This to me is what Jesus is teaching his disciples. If you want to be great, you have to find ways to serve. I've heard it said many times by some really good leaders that if serving is below you, then leadership will always be beyond you. And for us, when we look at the the life of Jesus, what he teaches us is that serving is giving of your life for the sake of others. So I want to ask you a couple questions as we're as we're drawing to a close today. And the first question is simply this, how do you and how are you responding to the questions that Jesus asks throughout? This passage to the disciples, the first question, what do you want me to do for you? If Jesus was in front of you right now, friend, and he was asking you that question, what would your response be? If Jesus says, what do you want me to do for you? What would your response be? Now, here's one of the ways to critique that response. 
does your answer benefit anyone other than yourself? When Jesus grants you the desire of your heart, who's lifted? Is it yourself? Or is the desire of your heart that others are lifted as well? You'll tell on yourself what the answer that you would give Jesus. The other question that Jesus asks is, can you drink this cup? Can you go the way of Jesus? Can you go the way of joy and suffering? Can you go the way of Jesus, laying down your life so that others might live? And then the other question I want us to look at and ask ourselves is simply this, who and how are you serving in your life? And are you doing it the way that we see Jesus in this passage? Are you doing it with a willing heart? Are you doing it with a humble life? Because friend, I've said this before, if we're doing things for Jesus, but not in the way of Jesus, we're ultimately not doing them for Jesus at all. Jesus' mission and purpose is on display and the invitation to you and to me is the same as it was to the disciples as well. That discipleship, true discipleship, is moving out of just duty and moving into a place of desire and a desire to follow Jesus all the way to the cross. Friend, we love you so much. Grace and peace.